Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kelly Seacat. My name is Donna Conwell, and we are your hosts of Scratch Space. Scratch Space is a virtual forum hosted by the Lucas Artist Residency Program at the Montalvo Arts Center, which is located in Saratoga, California, on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone people. With Scratch Space, we bring together visual artists, scholars, composers, activists, writers, and others to explore what kinds of radical imaginaries can unfold in this moment of pandemic, racial reckoning, economic uncertainty, civil unrest, and environmental crisis. We're interested in how do we think about what is possible and how can we use our imaginations to build a better present and future? How can we retool and create better and more equitable models for living and working together? So um, tell us about our guest today, Kelly. Well, I'm delighted to introduce our guests this week. We're joined today by Kim Yasuda, an artist and professor of public practice in the Department of Art in, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And Jennifer Parker, an artist and professor of art and digital art and new media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Jennifer is also founder and executive director of the UCSC Open Labs. Together we'll talk about the importance of pedagogical experimentation and collaborative learning and examine how we can create and prototype systems of mutual aid to perpetuate a healthy interdependent arts ecosystem that supports social transformation. Well, I'm really excited um, for this conversation today. Um, links to our guest four bios will be posted in the chat. Uh, we want to thank, of course, Nathan Zanon, our producer behind the scenes, and Bethan, who will be providing live captioning for this event today. And to access live captioning, please press the button that says CC on the bottom of your screen. I'm going to disappear shortly, and um, Kim, Kelly, and Jennifer will have a conversation for about 45 minutes, and then I'll return to field questions from you, our audience. So please remember to post your questions and comments in the chat. Thank you, Kelly, and I'll see you all soon. Thank you, Donna. Looking forward to having you back. So let's ask Jennifer and Kim to join me. Hey. Hello. How Hello. are you both? Hi, nice to see you. It's good to see you. I say that the best way we should start this moment is to take a deep breath. Here, here. Because I know you are both running between yes. so many things. And um, we are too somehow. Feels very, very busy again. Like everybody's gearing up for, for what's next. So I'm looking forward to this conversation today. And I really thought the best way to bring our visitors into the conversation with us and the most important was to introduce each of you and introduce your work. So as you well know, we put together a slideshow and I'm gonna share the screen and share that. And I think we'll start Kim with you and your work. Thank you. One moment. Sometimes it likes to disappear. <clears throat> Shoot. It's here. We were just looking at it. Here it is. Great. Great. So Kim, for our visitors are here with us today and on Facebook today, they know this work and we know it well um, from the city of San Jose. And I've lost you all. There you are. Um, so I'd love you to talk about this. This was a work you created in 1989 in your, in your life and work, which you continue today as a public artist. And this is a piece um, that was a memorial and a tribute to Dr. Annette Ernesto Galarza, 
And I'm really excited about sort of the connections between this work and actually what you're doing today. Can you speak a little bit about it? Uh, of course, it is um, probably, um, it was actually 1998 and um, my daughter's now 22 and she was born in 98. So I know it's a, it's a early piece, but it was a real seminal piece in terms of, you know, um, I was commissioned to do this project for the city of San Jose to commemorate, there were four commissions that commemorated, a, 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 you know, um, communities in that region, Ohlone Indians, the Japanese Americans. And interestingly enough, I was um, invited to do a commemoration with, er, um, to commemorate Ernesto Galarza, who was the scholar mentor, was the uh, mentor to Cesar Chavez, actually. And he was an activist scholar. He, he, he was a educator he, at San Jose State at Stanford, but he was also in the field with the farm workers, with the um, advocating at, at Congress for their rights, writing bilingual um, text and uh, scholarly publications. And that's all on that table. So he was many things and he, was, he had already passed. And in the five years that I did this project, I got to know and love this man and really model my entire future career based on this, this um, public art piece. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I was reading the piece is entitled Man of Fire, Paseo de San Antonio. And just reading about his lifelong pursuit of, of bridging academia and civil life, referencing the many facets of his work, including that's what this piece references the poetry and education and labor organizing and, and academia. It so sort of rings true to who you are today. So I wanna sort of fast forward a little bit to, to your life at UC Santa Barbara. And I know you began a project at UC Santa Barbara, um, the Institute of Research in the Arts. Can you just say a couple of things about that project? Um, the, the open container. Yes. Um, uh, again, um, I think we're, you know, the theme being mutual aid. Uh, I think uh, we're in a moment where individualism and rewarding that sort of scholarly individual uh, monographic <laughs> um, uh, author authorship, uh, we're, I feel as though that, you know, the answer is in pooling the best of everybody's resources, disciplinary, cultural, um, multi-sector. And so the, the UCRA was a system-wide arts research that actually was the first iteration of what Jennifer and I have since collaborated on, which is a system-wide, the 10 UC campuses arts research network that was housed at UCSB. And we did a series of um, pilots called Open Classroom Challenge. And this was a kind of demonstration project that I did with my students uh, called Open Container, ironically, but um, to uh, explore the notion of the classroom as an open space, as a different kind of space. And we took on two shipping containers and turned them into kind of a affordable housing template uh, at a time when uh, UC, when Santa Barbara had the highest medium home price uh, in, the, in the nation. And there was such a housing shortage and it was, it was desperately difficult, not only for students, but also for faculty to find housing. Um, and so this was a wonderful kind of uh, year long demonstration project uh, in the open classroom um, that was very successful. It was um, purchased by an artist. She now has it as a studio in the Palm Desert. And the funding for that has refunded our program at UCSB, so. Yeah, it's really fantastic. This idea of the experiential classroom and the open classroom um, and, and the way you put it into place. I want to move now to 2016, following um, a tragic kind of event that happened in the community of Isla Vista and, and a project you started with your students there, Lightworks. Well, it was actually, um, uh, you know, the first initial year after the, the shooting of six students, it was a, a real um, tragedy is uh, the students themselves organized a, um, a, a kind of community healing and uh, lighting. And I realized that our campus was a Nobel prize in um, solid state uh, 
LED lighting. Uh, we were recognized for that. And that part of the problem in the student community of Isla Vista is a lack of lighting in their 21 public parks. And that students don't have a way to socialize and engage other than their residential situations, which is high density and overpopulated. And so you start to see the sort of perfect storm behind a lot of this. It isn't just student behavior. It's a whole urban condition. And so Lightworks was really designed to illuminate community. That was the subtext of Lightworks to actually, uh, I, and then I, I got a uh, California Arts Commission grant to actually commission artists across California to do new works in the various parks in Isla Vista. And that was the Lightworks projects in 2016. So yes. some of the, um, and, there, and, and it kind of, again, the mutual aid model of getting recreation and parks district, the county, California Arts Council, uh, materials research lab, media arts and technology, art department, uh, students, faculty, staff, all involved in the hosting and presentation and design of this project was a labor of love, uh, but it was outside of you know the curriculum, but it really drew a cross sector. And one of the things is it brought the whole community, the whole county into Isla Vista, which is traditionally a student student area. And, and, and it felt like a, a kind of um, real pu functioning public space, right? So this is just sort of the lineup of programming and the many artists that were showcased. Um, and I think this is just an example of how many people you actually organized to become part of this. This was a, another kind of classroom space and another kind of learning space. Um, but also I think it's important, you know, this is a community that is almost entirely, if I'm correct, made up of students and probably workers, essential workers living in this community, which is unincorporated, true? Right, exactly true, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, and, yeah. And, it, and it is uh, an overlooked community in many ways because it's 21,000 uh, students who leave every, at, you know, at the summer and then leave after four years. So it, it lacks the stewardship. Um, the thing, the piece you're seeing is a very dark bridge that the university has a, a tunnel between the university and Isla Vista that it was a scary tunnel, but it was the gateway into the student community. And it sent a very message of neglect. And so out of uh, Lightworks came this wonderful multi-sector project with the Academic Senate, um, a, an artist in media arts named Marcos Novak. And uh, interestingly enough, the essential workers, the electricians took this on as a light censored art, art uh, uh, illuminated bridge between the town and gown uh, student community and it's a motion censored. And what's so beautiful about this project for me is that it, it, it was very low, little funding, but the electricians, our campus electricians keep it working year after year since 2016 um, on their own accord because they own this project, right? And uh, so it continues to be functioning today. Well, and with this idea of mutual aid and just the role of the arts, you have something that was just one in a series of many projects that became, you know, really, it helped with safety. It helped with access. So it's a beautiful project. I wanna share just a couple of the others. I mean, there were many, many projects you shared with me in the Lightworks exhibition. So maybe you'll just speak to some of them, but it's as though the students activated the entire community. Yeah, and they chose various public sites. Um, this was actually a, a, a fac, um, an artist from UC Santa Cruz, um, and I, I, we need to recognize who that is, and uh, did a, a mapping, a, a, a building projection mapping on an old uh, clinic building. It was beautiful. Um, That's great. And here's another. I thought this was interesting because you've got projection, you've got very functional installation works, and then, and then if I'm seeing this correctly, this is performance space. This is yeah. Dance. It was a choreographer, dancer, and a, a media artist. Um, that all that tent was um, was um, heat censored, so the body heat of the dancers would activate the 
projection and the color, but they also move throughout the town through the street. So the dance performance mm -hmm. actually migrated um, and, and centered around this beautiful uh, installation in one of our parks. That's great. And then this project I thought we're preparing now for our 19th annual teacher conference. So not only did your students activate civic spaces, but they worked with, with youth. You Sorry, we had, a, a, we had a, a partnership through the Materials Research Lab to, do, to, take, uh, to take, take this project to the energy unit in, for fourth graders. They have to learn about energy. And so they learned um, um, ink circuitry that would, would actually help them light up. And this is actually their community. This is actually, I, I created maps of their neighborhoods and they were able to light their own neighborhoods as an exercise in their fourth grade class. And then we actually created an exhibition platform for the opening of Lightwork. So these fourth graders were part of that California Arts Council, mm -hmm. Council artists. So like every tier of artists uh, from fourth grade college to professional artists were, were showcasing together. And that was really fun. Yeah, those layers of engagement are, are really phenomenal. Um, and what can happen out of that university and academic setting it's, um, thank you. So we're gonna come to 2019. It's a new project with your class. You're, you're learning outdoors, learning from the earth. Can you speak to this just a little bit? Well, what's so ironic about this is this calling I had for us to go back to some very primary, you know, uh, counter digital spaces and really look to the land for our lessons, right, in a sculpture class. And we did earth castings by digging these holes and casting concrete and plaster. And so just seeing the students with weight and gravity and physicality and dirt uh, was kind of a, a really powerful <clears throat> experience, uh, not only for them, but for me realizing that we had kind of um, institutionalize our classroom to be an exhibition space, a white cube, and how do we actually move ourselves again out into the land and, and, fig and see what it has to tell us. It's much more, you know, calling of the indigenous uh, knowledge systems. And so uh, we were, there we were sweating. And then, you know, that was what, what a few weeks before COVID hit. <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure what the next slide is, but. Um, well, I'm gonna take you to the desert. So we may be. Oh yes. Uh, and so, yeah, part of that class. Yeah, mm -hmm. part of that class was a field trip to Andrew Zettel's high desert test site where the entire class was able to um, engage in a workshop um, in Joshua Tree where um, uh, AZ West and high desert test sites has their entire amazing compound. And over about, three days, the students were able to actually um, um, learn how, traditional earth brick build, building or making a uh, very laborious uh, process, back breaking very hard, uh, but, but um, it was actually for an installation that will be forthcoming because it was canceled. This, this was going to be part of an artist's international exhibition project in the desert that was suspended for COVID and it's still um, in that place. So that was maybe, uh, maybe a couple weeks before March um, when everything uh, was closed down. And it's funny because the same exact activity was happening in our residency with Rafa Esparza, right? Oh, before. wow. <laughs> I think he had about 200 bricks he'd made himself. <laughs> Great. Um, so this takes us to, you know, this past year and you moving online. And I think Jennifer and I took long walks together remotely <laughs> as we, two weeks after I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we're back to the embodied experience in the earth <laughs> as a yeah. sculpture class, we were thrown online two weeks later. And um, this is just a, an image of the first assignment of, you know, the mask and the whole kind of relationship we were having with what, what that would mean. And the students explored that as a first project. And um, so, and then, you know, we did a lot of um, sheltering in, in place, uh, improvisational um, 
uh, assignments and exercises using whatever they had available at the time was very restricted, right? Because no one was going into shops. And, and that's where actually Jennifer and I were having a lot of restorative conversations that we can continue today. <laughs> so um, I have a couple of images of the end of the quarter um, where um, that's me actually, I realized we went through an entire quarter remotely and one of our last, uh, my final project was they were to each do an addition of however many people were in the class of a sculpture, of a small, you know, sculpture. Um, and it, so if there were 20 students, each of them did an addition of 20 and they all, and they all brought them or sent them to me and it took forever. And I had, you know, something like two classes and 900 pieces where I, I basically put them in additions, right? Each piece for, and then I, I did a whole road trip where I hand delivered to all the students the addition because that was gonna be the first time I would actually meet them in person. And it was, a, it was such a powerful mo moment for, our, for us realizing we had actually gotten to know one another, but that there was something so uh, powerful about, you know, the screen no longer between us. It was very brief, but very meaningful. So I, um, that's sort of the ending of that quarter. And, and now I'm chair, <laughs> so. Congratulations, it's an interesting time to be chair. Donna and I were, you know, fortunate to have a conversation for you not long before you set off on that journey. And I know for us, it was very inspiring and inspiring that, you know, you would take that kind of thought and care right, to reach your students in, in really a very difficult time. So thank you, Kim. I wanna um, turn to Jennifer so we can share Jennifer's work and, and then move on to our conversation. Um, it's nice to have you here, Jennifer. Hi. Nice, nice to reconnect. I thought the first thing, you know, you are at UC Santa Cruz and, the Department of Digital and New Media Art in, in the art department, but also you are the founder and the director of an Open Labs collaborative. And um, it's a research center within the university unto itself. And maybe you could just talk a little bit about kind of your creation of this because it wasn't long after you created this was the first time I was introduced to you and met you. And then we did a project at Montalvo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, the first thing I sort of realized after being at Santa Cruz for 10 years was that it wasn't open, as open as I had hoped, right? That I really was finding these kind of silos everywhere. And how could I change the culture? And how could I create a space that was open and that was diverse and that allowed you to experiment and ask questions and play between the arts and sciences? So it was really with a colleague in astrophysics, Enrique, um, who we had a shared student and it was so important to us to, to want to be able to um, create a space where we could work with those students across disciplines. And it was from that discussion, I was like, well, maybe we should create an open lab. Wouldn't that be really fun? Like we could, instead of your student having to go there and my student having to go over here, that we could actually be in one space together. And what would that mean? And what would it be like? And so that was the beginning of a conversation that sort of has spread and can, added sort of more and more bridges through disciplines. And, um, you know, it's always been project-based and driven by students um, who wanted to work on research in a way that was beyond just the, the classroom study. And in this idea, I think of mutual aid, it was always sort of me giving people keys or access or introducing them, almost becoming, you know, like their agent. Like, oh, have you talked to so-and-so? Or do you know so-and-so's research? And you realize people don't have the kind of wealth that you do as a faculty of how the system works. And so I saw it as a bridge for students between disciplines, but also to the public. And how can we bring the public in through these, into these open spaces and, and export a kind of way of thinking about research that wasn't um, rooted in, in just the student or the faculty or the staff, but that actually invited the public as a public institution. Yeah, it's really, it was great, because, you know, working in an arts institution, but having often collaborated with university system, they, they can be a hard system to navigate. And so I was really inspired early on when I met you and that you were sort of thinking about these internal networks and bridges. So Open Labs has 
you know, gone on to do many, many projects in the last year. We were 10 years old last year. Um, and one is the creation of the Algae Society. Yes, the Algae Society. This is a really exciting, fun project um, because I'm actually more involved with it. Often I'm not as involved or I'm sort of seen as a director professor in this instance. It's more than that. And, and what is such kind of beautiful in this idea of mutual aid is many of the Algae Society members are graduate students or were undergraduate students of mine you know, over the last 20 years that I've been at Santa Cruz. And so they've gone on to become artists or professors and they're in different parts of the world and they've grown their communities locally. And so when there was this opportunity to do an exhibition um, around algae that I had already been working um, in, with phytoplankton for some time, I sort of saw us as this moment of like, what is this species about? Like, how do you sort of acknowledge that we're working with a, a non-human species? And what would it mean to sort of collaborate with them and, and think about the ways in which, you know, th there's not only just mutual aid, but mutual survival. 50% of the world's oxygen comes from the ocean. And we only think of sort of the greening of the land. So it was this, it's been a moment for us to think about what it means to share a collaborative resource like algae between people but with the general public to understand it and and through a series of exhibitions and talks and stuff so you know we're spread out we're in new zealand we're in norway we're in the east coast um we're all over the place and we've been um sort of thinking through ideas of of algae and and all the different varieties and macro micro scales and um, bringing those also into sort of the, the, the radical local, I suppose, and, and thinking about, you know, the, the algae that grows in a puddle in front of your house, um, as well as in larger bodies of water and through the air. So um, speaking of the radical local. <laughs> Yes, so this is a pond by my house. I live in Oakland and, you know, it had had an algae bloom and I, I never had seen this before where, you know, that sort of layer of, of floating sludge on the top dries and it became like paper. And so I started harvesting it and learning about it through different ways of thinking of how to cast it. And, you know, I have a sculptural background. So it was really learning and touching and wanting to kind of understand this material as something that, that was um, kind of a, you know, bio design idea, but also more just trying to grow it and learn from it and, and become friends, really. Yeah, this idea to me is, you know, quite radical of bringing this, these microscopic organism into your collaboration, right? And actually giving them their own voice, if you will. Mm -hmm. This and it's image. And it's also trying to break down that hierarchy a little bit and just, you know, put them as equal players on the planet, um, you know, that we are, our, our job is to really sh be, should be in service of these species. And it also dovetails with a new MFA that we have at Santa Cruz, which is um, an environmental art and social practice. Um, and we are seeing that you need to have a lot of what Kim was even talking about, you need to have the, the kind of partnership with social justice, with people understanding their communities in order to think about the land and to think about the environment. It's not one or the other. It is a kind of systems-based thinking that has to happen. Yeah, it's really terrific. So these are just some images you were then in, in at UC Santa Barbara. And I know you and Kim have worked a long time together. We'll get to that in a moment, but these were some, some paintings you were researching. And then tell us about this lady. So the left actually is dried seaweed. So these are dry, is a collection of dried seaweed from the biodiversity um, center at UC Santa Barbara. And I actually did my undergraduate uh, work there like 30 years ago before Kim was there. But, so that was, you know, I had this kind of already sensitive place for Santa Barbara in my heart. So when I, when I heard that they had this collection of algae that's over a hundred years old, that people used to collect it and harvest and dry it out and make these beautiful images, it also reminded me of Anna Atkins. And oh my gosh, here's this woman who was basically thought of as the first photographer, who's a botanist and her whole relationship to um, drawing and thinking about plants really shifted once she started getting into cyanotypes. And so 
um, going through her collection and making these transparencies that I skinned on the wall of, of the museum, um, which is a, a kids art and technology museum in Santa Barbara downtown, was this kind of wonderful moment to sort of acknowledge the ocean that was there, the seaweed that had been harvested and collected, and also the light and that relationship to light um, in space, but also how it feeds the algae that feeds us and everything else in that in that way. Um, so we made her another um, partner in the algae society as well. Which is great. Um, and then you will be the algae society will be you'll have an exhibition coming up this year, correct? Yes, so we're gonna be at the Cameron Art Museum in North Carolina in Wilmington. Um, and we're just now finishing the plans for, for designing that and looking at and working with locals there, as well as bringing in more of our kind of global community. So there'll be lots of, um, lots of things happening. And, and it's because it's up for a year, it's also gonna always be changing and migrating and evolving. And um, we're thinking about weather, we're thinking about time, we're thinking about well, what does it mean to sort of be in relationship with these invisible microorganisms, just like COVID, and what does that mean in this kind of way that we want to support um, learning and, and, and love of objects and things, we also want to understand what we can't see. Um, and I think COVID is another way that we've also been experiencing these microorganisms. It's, it's, yes, it is. It's been <laughs> dominating these microorganisms. <laughs> I want to just take a moment, Jennifer, and share one of your more recent projects, um, which, oh, I, we forgot this guy. This we can move on. This was part of, in Spain, we did a show in Spain, and then um, it, it was also about icebergs and thinking about algae and all these different environments. In fact, one of our scientists is, is just left for the Arctic, and she's studying ice cores and looking at algae in those different spaces. And so this was a giant, this was a video projection, and again, it's, you can find that on the web, but it's it's thinking through these microorganisms in relation to ice and snow and, and iceberg. Yeah, it's on the website and you can see the video, which is really quite beautiful. Um, okay, so here we have a new project, What Makes Us Human, um, which began 2018. 20, well, it just 2020. Oh, it just I mean, it really- During yeah. COVID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Kim and I, as she had mentioned, you know, we've been working with this idea of placemaking and really thinking about our campuses as places, but then our place making on our local campuses, but then across the state, the UC system is, you know, really diverse and spread out. And so as I was looking internally at my campus, I had been working with the Genomics Institute, and that was a relationship that started, as you say, Kelly, in 2018. Um, so when COVID hit, I was like, oh no, our plans, what are we going to do? And it also was this, for me as a as sort of a digital artist, it made it an exciting moment to sort of reimagine. And there is a kind of renaissance happening in the digital space, even just doing this as an example. Um, and so, you know, the, we had a, already had a model of a 3D gallery of our, our gallery on campus, the Cessnon Gallery. And I thought, well, instead of just doing a show inside that gallery, actually, we could we could do it anywhere. Like we could be underwater, we could be up in the sky. You know, we don't actually have to be in this square model if we're digital. And so then I started to imagine these projects that were happening and the research that was going on across campus with ideas through the Genomics Institute with DNA, with our bodies. You know, how are we sort of as scholars and researchers responding to the pandemic, you know, whether it's in our institutions, our bodies or communities, you know, how can we be alone together and break out of our classrooms and, and really feel a different way than these squares that we had been in. And as a sculptor, the sphere for me is this moment where you can't see the whole thing. Right, you get a sense with the square, with the, the, the 2D image that you're seeing the picture. And here, there's something on the other side. And I felt like that's true of all of our research and all of our ideas. And so they're just symbols that sort of also was trying to shift how we look at the web. Um, so the, you know, it, it, it exists kind of as an index, as a website of, of work that's happening on campus, as well as artists that I invited from different parts of the world who are working with genomics and genetics and DNA as part of their research. And then there's this, which is the virtual space. So then you can also click and go into this four different galleries. This is a heat map. Um, over sort of sharing uh, ideas of climate change within that. And as we're looking at through these different ideas in genomics, there's a lot of ethics and ideas around what that means. 
um, bringing in the environment and how we even harvest DNA from species like seed banks to kind of collect them because they're, we're losing all of these species. And what does that mean if you have this code of life that gets passed on for millions of years that then disappears? Um, and so, you know, it, it is in this moment of climate change with species loss and DNA and genetics. And, and again, as we're just about, you know, in the process of changing the world's, uh, you know, uh, DNA with with our um, vaccine, we are modifying the human species. So it's pretty radical and, and wild and mutual aid, I think, is part of all of that. Um, but I want to make sure we have time to talk. So I'm not going to yeah, talk too much. This is our last slide, Jennifer, if you want to speak to it. Just briefly. Sure. Um, so this is an image where I, I put up these balls. We're floating above campus. UCSC is underneath. So we wanted to also keep that place. So we weren't just anywhere. We were really referencing the work that was at our location. And um, just to speak to the one sphere with the, the, the figure on it, that's gene genome. And it's a fictitious character um, that Daniela Zambada is, is working on right now in Instagram. And she's been creating all these different filters and interviewing people as a gene. Um, sort of taking on that persona as, as gene genome. And this space can also be accessed through VR technology. Am I right about that? Yeah, so it's done with this. Um, and I was actually working with Kim and some of her students talking about this. It's called Mozilla Hubs and it's open source. You can use a, 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 a tablet, a phone or a screen to access it. You don't have to have a headset. In fact, I don't, I don't really enjoy having it headset on it's like having a phone strapped to your head <laughs> so i enjoy being able to, to surf on those things through through the desktop browser so maybe we should try that deep breath again <laughs> you guys have downloaded <laughs> it's it's really true i think it's really exciting um the work you do and the way you you know, knowing your work just a little bit more closely, Jennifer, but also Kim, your work, the way you've sort of taken this and over the last sort of decade or so sort of built upon these collaborative spaces, these learning environments. And, and I mentioned to you both, and I know when Donna comes back, we're really thinking about the residency and what can happen when you actually have a place where you can bring people together for an extended period of time and start opening those disciplines. But then also thinking of like both of you and, and our collaborators and, and I just, yeah, I wanna sort of stop talking a moment and because you have so much to share in terms of this method and model and what it can look like today in terms of mutual aid. Yeah, I mean, Kim, I don't know. I mean, it was Kim and I clicked. We were at a conference together, I don't know, like six or seven years ago, where it was, you know, talking about placemaking. And Kim has really spearheaded the group and having been the the, the sort of vision behind UCIRA, which was a, a funding project that we could all always, you know, again, it was another, it was actually aid, like we could actually do our research because it's not recognized always within the institution. There's a very small amount of money that goes to the arts. Um, but I think as a sculptor, you find yourself always needing help, you know, and I, even this was before the, you know, we both came from before the digital divide, right, building things, making things, tools, you know, you need spaces that are shared, and it just is kind of a natural framework for artists in, in that 3D space, and so for me, um, it's always been part of my practice and I have more fun with people than I do alone and what you can do together and in community and how you can service that, I think is, is very similar to being a teacher. I would agree. The, 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 the other thing I think that's become so apparent to me is the, the, the incredibly vast and varied um, lives of our students are is a, are forms of knowledge that I learn from. So I've really mm -hmm. changed my, my positionality. And again, mutual aid is more about less hierarchical and more lateral and more, you know, more actually in the model of a kind of um, mycelial and algal um, colony where there's a real exchange of information and a learning, co-learning and co-teaching. Um, and it, it's a, it's kind of a, a uh, unexpected space for a lot of students who are looking to your your wisdom and your leadership and all of that and 
I really feel like that this is an opportunity with what, what is going on right now to reestablish some of these, um, these models, right? Or at least make them evident as uh, productive models. So um, really that's again, that, that the classroom really feeling and looking differently than what it's been before. Mm -hmm. um, as an artwork, as a, as a community engaged opportunity, um, inclusive, multi-sector, right? So. Do you find your students are seeking and students that are attracted to both of your programs are seeking kind of this interdisciplinary, collaborative, experimental kind of education and space? Yes, most definitely. I mean, I, I think the students are over the siloed lifestyle of, of, te of teaching and learning. And I think actually, you know, now I have uh, high school kids and and Kim has, her daughter has also gone through the K through 12 system. You realize how teach you, how kids are learning so much differently even when we were kids, right? And so they are put into these collaborative groups and they are used and told to sort of work in these ways. And then you get to college and you're suddenly on your own. And we hadn't really been updating, I feel like as well as we should have been our process of, of really, you know, that flipped classroom of why are we all getting together and staring at this professor? Why aren't we actually joining forces? Um, and I just think the work demands it, the ideas demand it, they want to, to work together, but not necessarily on our terms, but on terms that work for them within their system, right? And, and acknowledging that, you know, what we might organize for them might not be what they want. But I definitely think it's, it's also the next uh, generation of academics are they you know they want to use all the different media they want to communicate their ideas and their research in much broader strokes and publications and papers and that's where the visual language really comes in for them too um, through their ideas as well as through their research needing to have more um, systems thinking I keep coming back to that word but in that that way that it it's not it's not just mutual aid it's mutual togetherness and in, in thought and looking at the whole picture, I think. That's been something we've, it feels like we've drilled out of ourselves. We've gotten so, you know, over centuries, so specific in our studies and, and starting to step back and right, see that full circle. Know that mm -hmm. you kind of can see it and then you need to turn it and you need to shift it so that you can really see more of the picture to get the full understanding. I'm really struck by the open, uh, our campus now empty, right? All of our lecture halls empty, 400 seat lecture halls with seats facing the podium. And, and I'm imagining how we're going to evolve the uh, institutional infrastructure to a changing, right? Um, and so a lot of times this, this gets reinscribed not by the students or by the faculty, it's actually by the institutions, the way it's all been structured. Mm -hmm. around a certain kind of learning. So um, I'm curious to know how the, those classrooms are gonna feel or those lecture halls are gonna feel when we go back or you know, hopefully we go back, right? Mm -hmm. So COVID interrupted the work you both were doing together on placemaking, looking at UC systems and more integration even in the learning between the various universities. But I wonder what, what part of that is continuing on or happening or that the universities have actually been drawn to because it is a time of reflection. Well, and it's also a time of disorganization and crisis and planning. It's suddenly, you know, it's just like, oh, does people get at their shots yet? And how do we roll out vaccines? And it changes week by week. And you feel like, oh, no, we can't lose this profound moment to reshuffle and organize like this is it this is such a great time how can we do this but then the bandwidth for trying to keep the engine going like if we didn't have classes we could have imagined a new institution we didn't have to, to serve our students but we are still grinding the wheel and i think that um we could have you know thought about that differently I and mean, that we we have wasted a lot of faculty resources and student resources by just trying to do this online as opposed to reimagining and creating a really exciting kind of thing which would mean ditching you know what your major requirements are in order to think about the global health you know and from all sectors i mean i think Kim's like this too, like, you know, the only thing we should be talking about is the environmental crisis. The only thing we should be talking about is social justice. So, you know, 
how do we, you know, we do that in our classes and in our assignments, but the institution still sort of holds us back. Like we still can't co-teach, right? And there's points and systems, um, but we're working on it. And, you know, Kim and I are definitely like, come to my class. Now we can do that. I can go to Santa Barbara. I can talk with you. Like we can have this moment in the middle of our day. So these little cracks are opening. Yeah, yeah, I think convergence, you know, um, uh, I mean, I think at, at heart, we're connectors, you know, we're like you were talking about your role as a sort of resource broker in open lab. And mm -hmm. I think if we all could take on, um, a, you know, mutual aid is about really recognizing the opportunity of connecting resources to people and the confluence of, of their actions amplified in them being able to work together or or share resources or exchange something and that goes for students that goes for communities that goes for activist groups that goes for institutions museums right how could this model really really um raise the 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 whole do you know what i mean like we all i think uh, abandoning mm -hmm. sort of this ownership over things which is so academic that that we own the intellectual creation or property but to let go and 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 really take the you know have the the joy in raising the quality and the opportunity for everybody would just you know be amazing, <laughs> and so you know partnering across our institutions is super exciting. How could we do that? How could we you know Montalvo or you know how could we really um, and the land that connects us all, California? How could we leverage? you know, the opportunity of lessons of the land among our ourselves. The other thing I think that COVID and Zoom are presenting is this overwork and duplication of amazing programming that we we have we have to figure out how to converge some of that. So we're we can all be part of something together um, as opposed to right everyone hosting or offering different different things. It's a very pivotal moment, I think, for a systems change around communication platforms and convergence. I think that's absolutely true. The one thing is nice is the ability to sort of have this conversation, share it and then disseminate it. But you know how people are gathering and, and being able to take advantage of this wealth of an archive. Um, something that you know really sticks out for me is this kind of this bridging and sort of pulling the ideas of, of social justice um, together with the environment, because I think it's absolutely true. We need to, our bigger issue is actually the environment and spending that time and, and sort of pulling ourselves together as a humanity to look at that. Um, yeah, I, I'd be curious and I think we should invite Donna in, but you know, how you how you see this work. And I tend to have that same anxiety, Jennifer, where it's like, this moment's gonna end and we didn't make the most of it. And it's like, you gotta slow down. But mm. but I think to capture and to capture sort of what we've learned and and start conceiving of what it looks like going forward, how we how we create these kind of collaborative systems that can continue on and, and grow and invite more people in. And, you know, maybe it is through trying to sort of create these pods of memory. I mean, you always hear about short term memory and like, you know, this tragedies will happen and then the next week it's another one and we forgot that one. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, can we can we put memory clouds everywhere that help us or, and not have to move on all the memory. time? <laughs> Adrian Murray Brown who wrote Emergent Strategies, mm -hmm. many of you might know, she also did an anthology or was part of an anthology, Octavia's Brew, Brood. It's a great book, um, yeah. Right, yeah. And you know, the, thing, the notion of future and uh, futurity, um, she said something so beautiful. I've been, I think I've been quoting it every day, which is we, we need to move at the speed of trust. And I think that's also fundamental is to, uh, I see this at, a, at all tiers of, um, mm. of my, my place is it takes time you know you can't force it you can't you, it, it there, there has to be established and built those relationships right and that's what people aren't accustomed to taking the time for right so um you know how yeah. do we do that how do we slow down how do we slow down to, to build those 
relationships over time. I, I love that. We've been talking a lot about trust and sort of mm -hmm. the trust we've built over years is actually what is sustaining us at this moment. And um, you, it doesn't come fast. Mm -hmm. It comes slowly. Hi, you. Welcome back. Hi, thank you. Um, I just went down a rabbit hole from Kim thinking about um, Edward Murray Brown and the other book um, she has, Pleasure Activism and the Politics of Feeling Good. And yeah. Uh, yeah. It's such a great book and sort of reorienting how we think about our work in a really important new way. Um, so I want to, well, I just want to thank you for, you know, sharing your amazing and inspiring work with us today. It's like super exciting and it just feels like it's a conversation that we need to continue having because as Kelly was saying, you know, this moment, what this moment has kind of afforded us is an opportunity to really start rethinking what is the role of the residency and what role can mm. we play for artists, for the community, um, and one of our strengths is our ability to convene people around conversations and what that could kind of look like um, for us moving forward in the future. Um, one thing I was, you know, so struck by and so interested in your conversation about your work with interdisciplinary labs and cross-sector collaboration. And one thing I'm kind of interested in asking you about um, is about some of the sort of challenges of working in this interdisciplinary cross-sector cross way. Um, I was reminded of conversations we've had with another partner of ours, the SETI Institute and their Artist in Residency program, where they bring um, artists from more different disciplines into collaboration with scientists. And, you know, one thing I've heard uh, some of the folks working on that program mention is that it's kind of important that the artists have some grounding in science so that they can be, there's a, there's a place to have a conversation as like a shared language. But I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about around that and the sort of art, the challenges and the methodologies of kind of addressing those challenges and creating this true interdisciplinary exchange. I mean, it's it's real, but I, I would also say that you need to make sure that the science is grounded in the arts. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think we've, we've, we've given a lot of, of power and money and resources to the sciences to sort of have that um, perspective that we all have to speak science, but we don't all have to speak art. And I think that um, what I have found though, actually, is that every scientist is like a secret artist. Once you get to know people, they play an instrument or they, or they have people in their family, their partners, their kids, and they are very much into, and as academics in the sciences, I should say, um, lines of inquiry and how do we look at things? And for me, it always kind of comes to wanting to be part of that first piece of how we talk, right? And how we think and how we look through lenses. And when you look through um, telescopes or microscopes or your lens of your eye or your camera, you're, you're interpreting what you're seeing, whether it's bacteria or, you know, creating an image th through a camera lens. And so it is sort of that humanness, I think, that ties us together and looking for the hows and not necessarily the whys of the questions that creates these openings for, for curiosity. And I think, you know, my, the stuff that we do in open lab, they're never going to, you know, I'm not interested in, in, in making things look like science or asking these same sorts of questions or illustrating science. It's more getting people's interest sparked, want to learn more. And then the web and everything else is full of, of ways in which they can do that. So it's just about these kinds of sparks and these moments of things that maybe we didn't think about or see before. You know, even just this question of, of how do arts and science work together? It shouldn't be that complicated. And it wasn't, I mean, this is, this is rel this, within the, the scope of human intelligence and knowledge building. This is only relatively new within the last hundred years that we de-siloed ourselves and, 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 or siloed ourselves and then created this, this hierarchy between us. It's ridiculous. So I don't think people are all that different, but I do know what you're saying. And a lot of it is resource time, pulling people away from their research to, to collaborate with you, I'm trying to understand why they should. But I do feel like the sciences are opening up to seeing what the value is and not just as like the public engagement piece of their Yeah, research. I think that's totally right. And I think it just sort of speaks to this idea that 
it's not enough to just bring a group of people from different disciplines into a space. You have to create this yeah. platform, carefully considered way of how that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the neighborhood that that Kim made with her students. Like they were immediately familiar with it, right? It's. I, I will also add the other side of the science art, you know, this notion, it's true, um, Jennifer, and we totally, you know, in a, on a campus, this idea of, you know, kind of disciplinary resource imbalance. But I will also say that, you know, more, I'm mean, just going to give the example of some of the city uh, programs like uh, City of Los Angeles, New York, uh, Min Minneapolis have artists in residence in county government. Okay, mm -hmm. now, um, I would say that you know, my, my, in my mind, I think of a, an artist at every table of, of any tier of, of engagement, but that, you know, that means it's a certain kind of artist willing to sit through bureaucratic conditions mm -hmm. and find creativity, but we need more of that kind of voice within these bureaucratic structures where um, the artist is changing the conversation by just being there. Mm -hmm. And and so they're finding that the city of Los Angeles is renewing that program because artists in city planning, artists in transportation are game changing. Mm -hmm. the, the, and but if but again, look at the artists. Do you think many artists are prepared or want to go and work for government? But maybe we have to change that whole system of what it means and where an artist is and how we train an artist. Mm -hmm to be mm -hmm. able to engage, engage fluidly in these different spaces, right? With creativity, not to censor it, but to activate it. So I think about the two sides of all of that formula, you know? Yeah, it's like Jennifer said, how you get people speaking art, right? And mm -hmm. make that space for creativity to happen because probably we all know a lot of artists who would actually like to be in that space and, and an active voice in that space, not just somebody who was the observer. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think activist art is part of that conversation. I think a lot of activists don't even think of themselves as artists um, because they don't necessarily produce stuff. But I often think of that as a social practice. Um, and I think the field of social practice is, is growing to be more inclusive in broad strokes. Yeah, I would like to advocate for, you know, the way in which all of us trigger the imagination in everyone, right? So, so while I use the city government example, if we can activate a city planner to be the artist, right? Um, we're, we're really, uh, I think that, that to me is a kind of um, actionable um, opportunity to activate the artist in all of us, you know, um, mm -hmm. to engage. Um, Absolutely. We also have a comment in, in response to what we've been talking about, which is about um, the importance of listening in this equation of interdisciplinary collaboration and that being like the real, the center of it. Um, yes, which is point. super important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And witness to, you know, um, I think it's really, I think that's true. So true. Um, mm. And stepping back, you know, I think we often look for leaders, leadership, and that that the the kinds of leaders that are great and wonderful maybe aren't the, always what's needed at certain times, and that you actually need a different kind of voice. Um, and so, learning how to you step up and step back, obviously, is mm. an important piece of that. Mm. And again, to this kind of speaking art, or you know, it's also learning. It's the trust piece too. It's you know, how do you? Mm -hmm we get a certain kind of leader because it's what we think a leader should look like, right? But, but really, how do we rethink leadership? I think we all had a good lesson that should, you know, give us pause to reconsider what it means to be a strong leader and what that mm -hmm. means. Well, I'm going to plug the book that inspired the topic, Mutual Aid, um, Building Solidarity During This Crisis and the next one. And it's by Dean Spade. It's a part of a series, Verso book series. Um, and it does break down differences between leadership in a mutual aid model versus a charity model. And the mm -hmm. whole notion of when we give the charity model, right? That, that we kind of the philanthropic model versus the mutual aid model. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating um, and actually very instructive guide uh, for me as a chair of a department who's rethinking, you know, what does it mean to lead a department? Mm -hmm. department? 
of a bunch of artists, you know. <laughs> yeah, I just posted a link to that. But okay, great, great. That. Yeah. I think we should definitely get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 short and uh, it, it's like a little book you can carry in your pocket. <laughs> Listen, um, we have so much more to talk about. I'm just looking at our time and I want to be mindful. Um, do you know where Montalvo sits? Sort of a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a bigger jump from Santa Barbara, but we're just about there. And um, and this this is the important work, this idea of the land that we're in a public park and, and really what can happen in this space as we think about sort of social environmental justice and, and where we are. Um, yeah. Thank well, thank you, you for having so us. Thank you. Thank you. I like Thank to think you. of us as a, a, a chain with three per, with pearls on it that, you know, <laughs> right uh, across the state. <laughs> so it's exactly what it is. And there's earthworks, you see Santa Barbara uh -huh. students, uh -huh. with, we have a place to meet up. Convergence mm -hmm. space at Montalvo. Uh, How's that? Convergence. Yeah. Great. Space. Lovely. I love, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Donna, anything else? Well, there's so much more, but I think rather than taking us off another 15 minute conversation, um, I'm going to be mindful of the time and just say thank you both for your amazing and inspiring work. And I just hope that we continue the conversations. And I, I hope so too. That would be wonderful. How we can bring these ideas <laughs> to the residency. Yeah, that would be great. That sounds great. Thank you so much. You, thank you. Thank you. You are so welcome. This is great. Um, we will see you both soon. Take good care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So Donna, yes. I want to thank all of our viewers today who joined us and ask you if you'll share with us what's next for Scratch Space. Yes, I'd be delighted to. So um on March the 18th, we're going to be joined by um, Indira Allegra, a visual artist whose work explores memorial as a genre and a vital part of human experience. And Erin Christoval, who is a Los Angeles-based curator and programmer who currently works as an associate curator at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. And we're gonna be talking about memory, grief, uh, memorial, um, and kind of how we can move forward through these experiences without holding on to binary or all, no all or nothing narratives. So I'm excited for that conversation. Um, we also want to remind everybody of Montavo's upcoming Art in the Classroom 2021 virtual conference this Saturday, March the 6th, which is bringing together educators through a shared creative exploration of the power and benefits of mindful awareness, self-care and self-compassion. So you know, we've been talking about mutual aid today and so there seems to be a connection there. Um, the conference is gonna be investigating why self-care must be a priority when caring for others and in what ways can the art support the integration of care into our curriculums. Um, we will put a link to that um, upcoming conference in the chat. And thank you again for joining us today. <laughs>